Okay, this is the pre-class video for class number 10, January, July 19th, all right? So we are right now in the section of the class focused on practical wisdom, the virtue of being an educated citizen, what sort of way of thinking is it to think like a citizen? We took Aristotle's list of virtues. The first paper was related to personal virtues, vices, problems, um, stress, depression, uh, the biology of the spirit and revenge. The second section of the class was that longer list of Aristotle's virtues, uh, the virtue of wanting to live economically in the mean, in the middle class, knowing how to make laws and develop a culture, apply the laws, enforce the laws in ways that promote an economic system that incentivizes middle class, for example, a minimum wage that would encourage middle class. Um, and then knowing how to make laws in the economic system. So in um, so economics is one major area for public life. Then in uh, political per se life, there's knowing how to make laws that promote a middle class. And there's knowing which political candidates and which uh, political leaders, once they get the position, do a better job or a worse job of creating laws that promote a middle class. Then there's the creation of the laws. There's the creation of institutions that are well uh, structured, right? So that they will actually um, uh, apply the laws, right? Enforce the laws, carry through on the laws that are made, the institutions. Then there are the people who run the institutions, the judiciary, the judges and the juries who apply the laws to particular situations. So as we covered in the management section, every company, every organization has laws and regulations and um, right? Some of those are better structured than others. And then the people who actually apply them in specific cases. And then if a person has been accused of breaking the laws, how you punish them, first of all, what the punishments are, how, how much, how severe the punishments are. And then um, what the conditions are under which people are experiencing those punishments, right? So all of that is political stuff. And um, we talked about humanism as promoting human flourishing. And this is not um, antithetical to religion. I'm arguing that the classical virtues apply to every major religion promotes those same virtues, every major character that is respected in a religious tradition is respected because they exercise those virtues. The stories that we pass on to each other about Jesus or Socrates or other people we admire in a different tradition or humanists or Christians or whatever, the stories tend to reflect times when those people exercise those virtues. So um, we're going to start the class with those who did not present paper number one, reading paper number one. Then I have the speaking rubric way back on the first post. There's things we're looking for. You have to have one main thesis statement, one main point that you want to get across. Every other point you make relates back to that main point. It supports it either directly or indirectly. You know what you're talking about. 
And then you also know your stuff, right? You know your stuff. And then you also can project like you are obeying the basic rules of public speaking. So even online, you need to do that. And um, it's different online, but I think most of you will have jobs where you will have to make presentations um, either in person or online. So learning how to do it online is important. Okay, so after we do our paper presentations, on Friday, I asked each of you to bring a, some kind of humanism that you found online that was of interest to you. And so each of you explains what version of humanism you picked and why you picked it, what you thought of it, once you looked it up and looked at their mission statement or their values. Um, and I would like you to comment a little bit about were you surprised to find so many kinds of humanism? Um, it just shows you what internet can do, right? If you, if you know what you're looking for, if you're looking for things worthwhile, you will find worthwhile things. If you're looking for worthless things that corrupt your judgment, you will find worthless things that corrupt your practical wisdom. So a lot is at stake in terms of the internet. People can cultivate practical wisdom better than ever before. I get news that's way better than I could ever have gotten in the past. I get little video clips from professionals who are responding to a major issue of the day using their expertise. I mean, to me, it's great. I didn't used to have access to that. But of course, the story is that people go on to QAnon or conspiracy theories or Facebook, they get manipulated and they just live in this world that is run by those who are motivated by power or money or just status. They want to be an influencer. And, and so that's, that's a question of your mind. That's a very classical humanist question. Your mind, your ability to think critically and make good judgments about how to be a good citizen is extremely important. It was the foundation of liberal arts education. The internet could strengthen that ability. More people could have higher levels of practical wisdom than ever before, or of course, it can really destroy it. It can get people so they don't even have common sense because they've been able to go and create a fantasy world, a world based on fantasies or phobias, a world based on fears. So I'm just asking you to use your judgment. And I'm telling you, this class is very much about all the things people talk about with social media. And this is the old liberal arts education tradition. This is an old tradition, 2,500 years old in the, in the West, probably 3,000 years old in the West, but even older in uh, other cultures. Um, so after we go through sort of review humanism, um, then I you are required to read Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. And um, I would like you to give your three points, three reactions to that reading. Um, this is the web copy. It's 13 pages, not a long assignment, considering this is a whole week, <laughs> just almost a week's worth of class in one day, so this is not a long assignment. Um, and my job is to show you how Martin Luther King was very much educated in the Western intellectual tradition. He knew uh, St. Augustine, he refers to St. Saint, not only to the Bible, but to St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, natural law theory, 
He is a traditionalist in the Western tradition and particularly an American in the sense that he's progressive and Americans were progressive. Now, he's, it's interesting because he is more of a, uh, a Greek humanist and he's more of the synthesis of religion with Greek humanism. So he's very much in the ancient and modern, uh, in the liberal arts tradition that our founders pushed for. But he doesn't think like Newtonian. His idea of God is not Newtonian mechanics. It's more of a synthesis of Christianity with the Greek. Um, anyway, so I am going to go over a little bit of that. In the class, I do want you to present your impressions, you know, what, what it was that, you know, really stood out to you. Um, and then I will talk about this in the context and all these other contexts. Um, let's see. I guess personally, when I read it, of course, I think about my intellectual training, but that part where his daughter sees an ad for the amusement park and she says, oh, daddy, let's go. And he has to tell her she can't go because African-Americans aren't allowed. And he describes, you know, this cloud that comes over the child. And, you know, he doesn't want her to be bitter. He doesn't want her to grow up angry. What can he do? I mean, I had kids and kids are not naturally racist or sexist or classist. They don't care. They just want to play. They just, you know, they worry about if they're going to get the, be the last one picked for the kickball team, you know? Or they just want to make, you know, they just want to pick the kid who's the best baseball player. They don't care what color skin it is. It's just so shameful that adults condition children to, you know, to be racist, sexist, and classist. And, and adults, you know, plant the seeds of bitterness. The ones who are racist don't see the effect they're having on this little child. And I just, that really <laughs> gets me. I mean, my kids grew up in city schools that were very diverse, racially, culturally, um, and class wise. And I was so happy that they could grow up in those schools and also get a good education. I was so lucky. We just happened to live in a place that happened to have that. It's just terrible for me to, to look at what's happening with our school system. And schools are more segregated by race than they were before because it's based on class. Um, if you can live in a suburb, you pay your real estate taxes for good schools in the burbs. You don't pay for the kids in the inner city. And their houses aren't worth as much money. They can't pay as much taxes. The schools are not as good. They don't qualify for the good colleges. It's just this horrible syndrome. I told you that before, it, sorry. Um, anyway, so let's do Martin Luther King. Um, this is where he describes, I want you to compare this to Black Lives Matter. And if you want to go online and check out some of this stuff, the same things happened when people came to demonstrate at in the big cities <clears throat> and there were the calls to demonstrate. People would say the outsiders are coming in. <laughs> Martin Luther King was condemned that way. So I remember my students, I was teaching this last summer actually, <clears throat> And they said, you know, they started mimicking all these things. 
And they thought that, well, in Martin Luther King's time, there wasn't the kind of violence that there is. And I was like, you guys, you got to read some history. I know that, right? Because I was alive and I remember it. There was actually more violence in the 1960s demonstrations, civil rights demonstrations. My father marched in Selma, I think I told you that. Oh my gosh, there was violence. The, the country was on fire. The Vietnam War, I mean, when the students say, oh, you know, but now it's violent, didn't it used to be? Absolutely wrong. Um, I was amazed at how little violence there was. But of course, I didn't know for sure. So I, I heard an expert from Princeton, Princeton professor, social science, who was doing all this research as fast as possible, right? Every demonstration, how much violence. And he came out with a statistic at one point, 93% peaceful. That's incredible. That's way higher than it was for Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King had, had a lot on his plate. Um, and so we get history sanitized, right? The students either don't know the history or they get this Martin Luther King Day version, which is really <laughs> not what was going on. It's a Pollyanna version. It's sanitized. It you know doesn't correspond. And they need to know that because the one they're living in is down and dirty and there's complexity and ambiguity and there's all this stuff. And then they think, oh, back in the good old days, it was clearer. I was like, no, it wasn't. So please, you know, sort of get over that. Um, and same thing happens this time. Um, you deplore the demonstrations, but not the conditions. And so there was so much coming up about systemic racism, not just in the police force, but in the housing, in the schools, in the this, in the that, in the healthcare system. In the you know the vaccination problems, the fact that poor non-white people were frontline workers, they were much more vulnerable to COVID. It's just right. It just all converged last summer, so that you could start thinking about the systems. And um, so Martin Luther King, what did he do? He gathered the facts. This is the nonviolent campaign. So these basic outline is still followed, right? It was followed in Eastern Europe. It was followed in, in there are books out about these nonviolent demonstrations. They follow certain rules, certain steps. So this, um, this document is really important in that sense. And somebody who was interviewed last summer said that they went back to the letter from Birmingham jail to get their sort of step-by-step uh, -step playbook for how to do it. Um, they tried negotiating. Then they had workshops to get people to practice. If, you know, if a police officer hits you, are you going to resist? So John Lewis got beaten 60 times and um, he died within the last year. And there is a John Lewis Voting Rights Act that's uh, being considered in Congress. I'm not gonna talk about what's happening to it because you should find out. That I'll tell you, you should know, but I'm not gonna talk about it. I know about it. <laughs> um, there was an economic boycott. That's another way that you can try to change behavior is don't shop at stores that are racist or whatever your agenda is. Um, and I do that, right? Every dollar I spend, I'm aware, are you supporting a good company or not? Are you supporting a good product or not? Um, I, When I was in Batesville, I went into Walmart more than I wish I would have. It's hard to get stuff, but I would buy the healthy food at Walmart or I would buy the recycled uh, toilet paper, <laughs> not literally recycled, right? But the low fossil fuel so that Walmart would keep selling the stuff, right? So try to keep the fossil 
fossil, low fossil fuel products at least being offered at Walmart, somebody's got to buy them. So, and healthy food, you know, I buy healthy food at Walmart. And lots of times though, they stopped uh, having some stuff I would buy because not enough people would buy it. But uh, you need to know, right? You need to live conscientiously. When I look at my food, right? The average plate of food for an American goes around the world 150 times. So, so I do think you ought to think about where your food comes from, factory farms, so, uh, and racism, right? And how a company operates. If it does promote a middle class, does it give people part uh, full-time jobs? benefits, whatever. So economic boycotts or just being conscientious about how you spend your money um, is important. Again, as college students, it's very hard for you to be picky. And I wasn't able to, you know, pay a little bit more for a company that has better conditions until I was over 50. <laughs> so I, I get it but just keep it in mind, okay? Then there's direct action. They tried, right? They po postponed it and they got accused of, right? You're willing to break laws. You're a bunch of lawbreakers. And he said, no, the Supreme Court outlawed segregation. So the Jim Crow laws are illegal. They're not breaking federal laws, they're breaking laws that the states have that the Supreme Court declared illegal. So there are, there's a standard for justice over and above what any one ruler, any one leader uh, decides. So it's not the case that might makes right. It's not the case that if you have the power, you can make whatever laws you want. And that's what justice is. No. So this standard of natural justice based on human nature. Afri people are not intellectually, everyone has the same capabilities regardless of race. So those laws were made on the assumption that they didn't, and that's a lie. We know it in terms of science. We know it in terms of social science. We know it in terms of philosophy and theology. It's just these the philosophy, theology, these, these things have been used to support racism, but now we know those were lies. Um, so a just law is one that squares with the moral law and the law of God. So the moral law is based on Aristotle, um, and then the law of God is based on the Bible, right? Um, an unjust law the powerful force the powerless to obey, but they don't obey the laws themselves or the laws themselves discriminate. Um, an unjust law is voted in by a minority and everyone is forced to obey. Uh, there could be a law that's just on the surface, like parading without a permit. So that's what I said in the stream, right? It, it looks fine, you know, you shouldn't have to get a permit to march through the streets because you have to block the streets off things. That makes sense. But the demonstrators were never given a permit for no reason other than racism. Um, so you break the law openly, willingly, you accept the penalty. That's just like Socrates, remember? He knew he was gonna get in trouble. People would consider him a lawbreaker even though he wasn't. Uh, because of their applications of the laws and his conscience forced him to break it and he did it openly and he accepted the punishment. Um, then Martin Luther King was more uh, disgusted with people, white moderates who claim to care, but then they don't do anything. And, they're, and when push comes to shove, they're threatened by the violence. And I, I understand that's annoying. It's, I, there's a word for that, limousine liberal, right? 
somebody's got money, but they also really like to be proud of themselves because they're against racism but they live in their burb with their house and go to their schools and you know they don't live with people they don't really help anybody but they are really proud of their belief system uh yeah and then when the demonstration started to be violent the moderates well that's that's too much that's radical that's extremism and you know, that's frustrating because you're deluding yourself, right? Self-knowledge. You think you're more virtuous than you are. And for Aristotle, virtue, you know, everybody talks about virtue, but virtue is what you do, right? Down in the duty, uh, down in the dirt, um, boots on the ground, the incarnation, Jesus. The word is incarnate. It's in your life. It's in your way of life. And he's saying, you know, hey, you guys, no, you have this discarnate view. You think you care about racism, you do nothing. And then you criticize people who do something. Um, he said, we have to go through a period of tension to, to make this transition. He got accused of precipitating violence, exactly what happened in Black Lives Matter, right? It's the demonstrator's fault because they've precipitated violence. No, um, the people who are against change will, they precipitate violence. And there were people all over the country, but I know specifically in Minneapolis because uh, I, my daughters went to high school two blocks from the major demonstration in Minneapolis. My son used to live half a mile from where George Floyd was killed. I used to drive through there all the time. So um, I know that there were people, undercover agents, who literally came to those demonstrations and started to be violent. And they tried to trigger other people into being violent, violent so that the demonstrations would be discredited, right? They really, there really are people who do that and you've got to realize that. Otherwise we will never get meaningful change and we will have a much more authoritarian society than we really should have. Um, King was accused of being extreme, same with Black Lives Matter. It's not <laughs> true. Um, you should not accept being oppressed. So he said some successful African-Americans are indifferent. Some, um, some really, really desperate people are bitter and they react violently. And um, that went on during King's time and that went on today, last summer. Uh, but he says, you know, love is the way. And he gives a lot of examples of people who did the same, including our founding fathers. They were violent, right? Um, they declared war on their country. Um, the church as a social institution is, some people say it's not supposed to have anything to do with social and political affairs. And King completely disagrees with that. And I completely disagree, and it was never true. Uh, the early church um, was considered, they were considered to be outside agitators because they were critical of the institution. But he said now, too many of the churches are defenders of the status quo, which they are, they associate uh, Christianity was supporting militarism, patriotism. It's the, it's the religion of empire. And that happened after 9-11. There was a very deliberate campaign to associate Christianity with, with an American empire and patriotism and uh, militarism. Um, or the church is a social club. So most churches really are social clubs. Um, they just like-minded people, you know, sort of congregate on Sunday, Sunday morning and talk about how wonderful they are and their beliefs and 
they just don't talk to each other and that's a serious problem. Our founding fathers allowed in people from different denominations that they didn't expect would probably get together on Sunday morning, but they were very concerned that the rest of the week they had town hall meetings and they got along together and they could create this climate, political climate of political leaders that really cared about everybody equally. So the, the founders were concerned with what sort of poison would be taught in church. And that's why John Locke separated, wrote a long letter about the difference between your conscience as a citizen and your conscience as a, a Christian, in his case, a religious believer, but your religion should never cause you to have animosity or to, to legitimize violence, oppression toward anybody outside of your religion. Um, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny, the American dream. This is true, right? And it's always been true. And it just continues. I will say as an old timer who was there at the civil rights movement, that the difference this time is that there were, there were so many African-Americans professionals. And again, I went onto a news um, whatever center that they interviewed so many African-Americans who were mayors of big cities, um, the police chiefs in big cities, uh, governors, U.S. House, senators, uh, state um, uh, political leaders, um, historians, PhDs, college professors, just a lot. And that, that was great. I mean, we need to do more, but that, that is something that's changed. Thank goodness. But I don't think it's changed enough. And then we, we are going backwards in a lot of ways, uh, which is really worrisome. So don't ever think a problem is solved. It's not. Every day you have to keep working on preserving a middle class because if you don't work on it, it will shrink. And racism, sexism, all this stuff, you can't be passive because the fallback you know, the comfort zone of people is going to go backwards and going to resist change and resist the truth because habit custom is not truth. And it gets farther and farther from the truth as social evolution, as things change. Somebody who just wants to go their comfort zone gets farther and farther out of touch with reality and worse and worse at practical wisdom and at knowing who to vote for and what to look for in a politician. So you have to keep working on it. Um, then the outline, I gave you, um, okay. So I quoted some of my favorite quotes, um, four basic steps and, um, okay. All right, so these are some of the high points that I that you could look over. Um, and I guess I have that in the outline. So those were my favorite quotes. Um, all right, I have another outline where I compare King to a prophet. So I talk about the prophetic tradition and I will put that on, um, on the site when I'm done with this uh, lecture, we could talk more about the humanism talking points if you'd like to. Um, if anyone wants to bring that up, they can. Otherwise, I think um, I really look forward to your thoughts about Black Lives Matter. Um, yes, okay. So, I put paper topics for your third paper. You could, um, you, they're toward the end of this list. The earlier ones were from last week. 
But this was my speech where I brought out his struggle with organized religion. Um, and you can, you can think about this, right? To what extent is this stuff still true? To what extent will it be true your whole life? Because it's just a pattern. Well, every time a child is born, parents have to decide how much do I conform to the status quo and how much do I keep testing it to make the world a better place for my kids? How much do I, you know, become a conservative to protect what I have? And how much do I realize everybody loves their child as much as I do? And I have to work so that every child can have a, a decent education and a safe space and all those things every parent wants. And some parents have kids, I don't care about anybody else. I'm going to move away. I'm going to live in my birds. I'm going to separate myself from problems because my little honey bun, you know, has to be protected. Or they go, wow, I got to make sure everybody has what I know I want for my kid. Um, so he was a radical conservative, right? That's sort of like a spiritual humanist. Um, I do want you to be creative in your papers. The, the words we use tend to get tied to old habits and customs, so they tend to be out of touch. So what tends to be progressive and important will be, you know, something that you think is impossible, right? So he was a radical conservative. America's founders were radical progressives, right? <laughs> Even though he was conservative, he was labeled a liberal extremist. You need to think about that. We have a natural capacity to recognize the truth, even though we get socialized into racism and other kinds of lies. We can get over our socialization. Liberal arts education is designed to awaken a student's capacity for intellectual honesty, as King knew. Um, he unified faith and reason. Um, so if you want to talk about any of that, either in your post for Monday or um, in your paper, in your third paper, those of you who have not yet written your second paper, uh, if you want to write on that, that's also possible. So I am going to quit now. And... Um, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow, and I will post that one more um, outline with the prof prophetic tradition on it. Let's see, stop.